I'm also a graduate of this program. I graduated Teen Challenge 20 years ago. Um, I came in at the age of 24, a broken and uh, hopeless addict. I had been addicted to crack cocaine, heroin for 12 years. It destroyed every aspect of my life and everyone that was connected to me who had to endure that whole thing. Um, I'm very grateful to God that there's a program like Teen Challenge that um, not only had a bed available, um, but it was a faith-based ministry. And God has truly used this program to change my life. Um, and I'm blessed to be able to continue to, to work with the ministry. Um, when I finished the program in 2000, I stayed on the Teen Challenge for 15 years. Uh, working in various capacities, continuing to serve. Um, prior to coming to the program, I was raised in church. And um, I accepted the Lord at an early age. Uh, but there was dysfunction in my home. There was dysfunction in my own life. And at the age of 12, when I ran, I ran hard. And um, coming into a program like this, even though we come in as adults, there's still a lot of trauma, a lot of um, years of things that God uses this program also to help us work through um, while we are being able to encounter our Savior on a daily basis. Um, the statistics in the United States are really scary and really sad. 196 overdose, overdose deaths every day. And um, any one of these women could have been number 197. I am grateful that they are here with us today with breath in their body. You may know someone who has an addiction. I pray that today if um, and you'll be able to share the hope with them that there is treatment out there for those um, who struggle with life control and problems. We, um, Teen Challenge, we're a long-term faith-based residential recovery program. We are for men and for women. We have Rhode Island represented here, but there are men's programs uh, in our New England system. Um, it's long-term, it's not a quick fix. We do not offer a 30-day program. Um, you know, and there are successful programs that are you know, out there, they're doing some you know, some good work to help people, but from my own experience, uh, it took a long time of learning how to be consistent, and persevering, and developing in my faith, learning how to put it into practice, um, to relearn how to adult all over again. And that's what this program does. And that only offers um, an opportunity for uh, women to come in and get off of drugs and shine them up on the outside, but it's an inner work that God does while they're with us through their, through their academics, the restoration with their families, the ladies have prayer, they have worship time. There are five phases to our program. And in those five phases, they're challenged at different levels throughout. And in the last phase of the program, they start to receive life coaching for um, the planning for the next step for their life, whether it's to stay on in the ministry or go home to a family, go back to a career, go off to Bible college. There's hope and there's a future. Amen. There's a future. The home on 572 Elmwood Ave, where this program is, um, once upon a time was a funeral home. Mm -hmm. And the people that came in that home came in dead. The women who come in this program, we come in spiritually dead, but they leave alive. Amen. And they're given life while they're there. So it's a total transformation how God has uh, done know. <laughs> you were once dead, but now you are alive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're very, very grateful for that. Um, Teen Challenge, we have been. This is something that's uh, dear to a lot of women, myself included, having been a mother when I came in the program. Um, we have been given the finances to either build or to open, uh, to purchase a home for women with children. Amen. 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 <laughs> Restoration without separation. I myself had two, two sons when I, came, when I came into the program. I knew I was in no, no way, shape, form ready to be a mom at that point. And I thank God that I had family to care for my, my boys at that time. But that's not the case with everyone. And we don't want to have to turn away women because they don't have someone who can just, you know, take care of their children for 15 months. It's not, again, it's not a quick fix. So we are looking to, um, we are in the process. We are actively seeking, um, you know, the door for God to open for that. So if you would be in prayer with us for that, we're looking to raise the finance for that first year of operational costs. And when we get started, we can just um, hit the ground running. Um, if you didn't see outside when you came in, we have a table. Um, there's some products out there, some jewelry that our ladies hand make. They string every bead on those bracelets. It's a patience, uh, a patience tester, um, but it's also part of their work experience program. Every everything out on that table, every bracelet is a testimony of the life that you see here. So anything you do give towards this ministry goes right back into the running of this home 
Um, we also have um, some cutting boards. Now, I ran into someone this morning who said they like to cook, um, but these are also handmade. They're handmade at our men's campus. They have a carpentry shop, so you have men that come in the program, some who've never even held a tape measure, um, and they bring it to the, from start to finish, and you'll see the completed um, products out there. So they're made with love, um, and again, everyone is a testimony. Um, how many of you here have Facebook? Visit our page. It's a great way for you to see what God is doing uh, in our program. Our director, Deb, is faithful to post every happening that goes on. You will feel like you know these women firsthand because not only it's their testimonies, it's everything that God is doing, any uh, events that we have going on, but we're constantly reaching out. It's also, it's also an avenue um, for those people who are seeking or looking for treatment to be able to see um, those who are overcoming and in the process of overcoming. So um, visit our table. We have um, um, a book called Change Lives. It's 10 testimonies of those who have overcome by the power of God. And through this ministry, again, another great uh, opportunity for somebody who's struggling. I first heard about Teen Challenge when I was 14 years old, and a family member gave me a book called Please Make Me Cry by Cora Rodriguez, and she was the first woman that ever came into Teen Challenge in New York. And the home that we live in um, was opened by Jackie Strada, who was a spiritual daughter of hers who came through that program when she was still here. So that book, to me, gave me a testimony of what this program does. So don't think that the seeds that you plant, that they don't, that they don't produce fruit later on. So um, if, if any of you not receive a prayer card when you came in from our ladies, I would encourage you, um, the ladies will be standing out back um, after. If you would like us to pray for you, we ask that you fill it out, fill it out legibly. We would love to be able to do that. We have a corporate prayer every Monday. Uh, we we want to be a blessing to the body, the same way the body is a blessing to us. So please see our ladies. We would love to talk to you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the choir so you can see and hear for yourself what God is doing in our residence, and then I'll be back.
family was not trying to send me to another program. They had completely lost hope in me, and I had lost hope in me. I had given up on life. I look at that person before, and I'm not the same person. I am not the same person, and it's because of the vessel that God uses, the Teen Challenge, um, the leaders that pour into us. We are loved back to life. I didn't know what to expect when I walked in. I thought, maybe I'll just get sober again, because I've done that before. I've gotten sober. I've gotten cleaned up. God has so much more. He's a supernatural God. He's not a human God. He's supernatural, and he has such big power, bigger plans for us that we could even imagine. Hallelujah. So I slowly started, like, just doing simple obedience, just doing what my leaders told me, just, like, getting up, learning how to just get up in the morning, brush my teeth, put on clean clothes, just, like, the basics, and then slowly just started reading the word, worshiping, praying. I didn't know how to do any of that, but God's like, come as you are. I don't care how you do it. Just do it. And so I slowly started developing that. And now, just recently, and thank God it's a long-term program because Quick Fix is not for me. And God would not have done anything. God is just breaking into the surface of my heart, producing fruits of the Spirit, kindness, joy, goodness, forgiveness, gentleness. Those are things that are cultivated through Him. Nothing of me. He gets all the glory today. Today, God is restoring that relationship with my now six-year-old son. I'm going to visit him next month. I'm going down to Virginia. We haven't been with each other in three years. And God has a plan for that, too. I just get, came back from a past with my brother who saw me as the worst of my addiction. He's not even safe. He doesn't even know if there's a God, but he saw something different in me. Today, I want God to use me as a vessel for his light, for his love. And I'm um, just so grateful for what he's done. I do plan on staying on to continue to let God do the work of me in an internship here and to see what he has for me. And just to give back what so freely given. The verse I stand on is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plan that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for a hope and a future. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. Amen. Amen.
fentanyl. Um, I had been raised in the church. I grew up in a Christian home, but I walked away from it when I was an adult. But even though I walked away from Jesus, he came and found me. <laughs> That's why the verse that I stand on is Luke 15, 7. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Good morning. My name is Lindana. Um, I've been in Teen Challenge for almost 10 months. Um, God has rescued me from a fentanyl and cocaine addiction. As a child, I was abandoned by my mom, left to be raised by my dad and my grandmother. And this just left me feeling broken. I couldn't understand why she didn't want me. And I never understood how God was going to love me if the woman had carried, who had carried me for years, well, who had carried me for years, for years I just walked around trying to figure out what I could do to gain or what I could do to make other people love me. At the age of 12, I went to live with a family member where I was sexually abused for four years. And at the age of 16, I spoke up and told someone, and we don't do that in my family. You just take whatever you get and you move on. I couldn't believe that I was shunned by my family. They were just so upset by everything that had happened. They were upset with me, not with who had hurt me. At the age of 18, I moved to Massachusetts and... Um, I just fell in with the wrong crowd. I started using, started lying to everybody and lying to myself more than anything, thinking that I was okay. I met some people who were Christian and I saw the joy that they had and I wanted it so bad, but I still couldn't figure out how I could get God to love me, how I could earn his love or his grace. So for a while, I lived a double life. I went to church during the day and I partied at night and I just, I lived a double life. I served two masters. God loved me so much, though. He blessed me with a man who loved me more than I loved myself, more than more than anything in this world. And my husband, he confronted me last year. He said, what life do you want to live? What are you going to do with yourself? Who do you want to serve? And then I made the choice that I would detox and that I would go and find help. He found Teen Challenge for me. And I detoxed at home for six days. And during that time, I almost died. And I had my pastors, I had my husband in my bedside just praying and just pouring into me, asking God just to save my life. Amen. I went to Teen Challenge, and um, at first I really didn't feel anything. As you can see on my before picture, I was dead inside. I felt nothing. I looked in my, at myself in the mirror daily, and I didn't even recognize who I was. But slowly, God started breaking down my walls, and I could hear his voice telling me how loved I was. My leaders poured into me, and... Slowly, I was able to love myself again, and I'm, I'm able to be proud of myself today. I'm proud of who I am and who God has restored me to be. He has restored me to be who he called me to be, not who the world said I was. Yeah. I'm blessed to be able to serve in the admissions department. Today, I'm a wife. I'm my husband's best friend. I'm a daughter again to the mom who once abandoned me. I have forgiven her. And I'm so excited to see what God is going to do in my life. I used to think, at first I thought that he brought me to Rhode Island to just get me clean and sober, but he brought me to Rhode Island to change my life, to transform my heart and soul, and I'm so grateful today. At first, um, growing up, I sung in the choir, and I was um, so excited when I did it, but the enemy had just stolen my voice. He had told me that, you know, how could you sing for God when you do so many things for me? So today, as I stand before you, I'm free!
The destination was in the sentence. So when the storm came and it shook them, where's your faith? So we have to remember his word and remember who is in our boat. He was sleeping, but he wasn't unaware. When Jesus is in the boat, we can't sink. And that's not making light of the trials and things that we face and encounter in life and whatever depth um, that you may be. But there was an expected destination when he spoke those words. Let us go to the other side. There was an expectation and there was a purpose. And in the middle of the two was the lesson. Amen. The lesson, the trial, and the testing of their faith by something that came and shook them a little bit. Jesus was the life preserver. His calling and divine purpose for our life, it does require change. And sometimes in those times of testing, that's where we dig in our heels and we begin to learn. And his word becomes more real to us in scenarios like that, and maybe it does at other times. We have those mountaintop experiences, and those are great. When you lift something up high, when you drop a heavy object down, what does it do to the dirt? It makes an impression. So when God allows us to experience those, those high moments, just know that when we come down, it's so we have some depth to us and to our character. So, yes, storms will come, but hold on, Jesus is in your boat. There is an expected destination. So, life is a challenge, but the greatest insights come through challenging times. Our program is called, well, now it is called Adult and Teen Challenge, um, originated as Teen Challenge, but we, the Women's Home has always been an adult program. Um, it's challenging not only because the people God brings in are challenging, I know because I was one of them. So I can say that and not be offensive to our ladies. Um, it's a challenge. The organization is, <laughs> this is what God sends us. When God sends us to people, sometimes the people on the other side are a challenge. And when you get to the other side, there will be people out of their minds. They will be hurting. They will be dying. And they will need somebody who's been tried and tested their faith. So the disciples, the middle ground, the purpose was to meet the person on the other side. Yes. See, Galilee needed Jesus, and he preached and healed the sick. But Jesus came for all people. Thank you, Lord. He was compelled and led by the Spirit to go to the other side. So who's on the other side? Who was Jesus looking to encounter that particular day? He knew, and he knew exactly what it was going to take. Verse 26, they sailed to the region across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus, when Jesus, I love this, when Jesus stepped ashore, I picture he's stepping out of the boat and he puts his foot on that ground. He was met by a demon-possessed man. He was met by a man from the town. He was well known. For a long time, this man had worn no clothes. He had the um, or lived in a house. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of that man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and under guard, he broke free. He was driven by that demon, those demons, to a solitary place. I know for me, in my addiction, I was driven to a solitary place. Jesus speaks to the heart of the matter when he said, What is your name? He replied, Legion, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to throw them into the abyss. <laughs> but there was a large herd of pigs feeding there on the hillside. And the demons begged Jesus, Let us go into the pigs. He gave permission. Yeah, he gave permission. And they went down the steep, the steep bank and they drowned. When those tending the, pig, the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town. It was the big talk. And the people went out to see what happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the 
demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind. Amen? And they were afraid. They were afraid. This was no particular person. This wasn't some stranger. This was the town lunatic. This was someone that had made his presence very known throughout the town. Those who had seen him and told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured, and all the people of that all the people of that region asked Jesus to leave because they were overcome with fear. So he got on the boat and left. Let me backtrack a little bit. So they're on the other side. It can be easy to minister to our own kind of people, whatever your own kind of people is. It can be easy to minister to people within the walls of the body. But what about the outcast, the alcoholic, the prostitute, the junkie, the suicidal, and those who are far from God? That's a challenge to us as believers, not to limit the God of all circumstance yes. 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 to our human reasoning. You know, I don't know what your line of prejudice may be. Um, we all have our areas of where we may feel comfortable. Jesus came for all people. Thank you, and he stepped over the side of that boat. He meant, I'm going to tell you what he meant. He meant an unclean man. The area was populated with Gentiles. You know this by the herd of pigs. So he was religiously unclean. He was rejected by the Jews, defiled, and looked down on. I can relate to that. Yeah. I was too shameful to even want to step in church at certain points. Jesus, but Jesus said, I will never cast you out in John 6, 37. He was met by a naked man. He was back out of his mind. He was someone with no clothes, no money, no shame. He was stripped of everything. But Jesus knew someday he would hang on a cross, stripped of his clothing, Matthew 27, 27. He went to a homeless man. For this man lived in the tombs of the dead. I'm sure his family and friends weren't there to offer him a blanket. They were afraid. They were afraid of him. I don't know about you, but in my addiction, in my worst state, my family was afraid. They were afraid. My children were afraid. But Jesus could identify because the foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, Matthew 8, 20. He went to a strong man. Often they would bind him with chains, but not even irons could hold him, for his strength came from the devil. But Jesus knew no fear, John 19, 11. He went to a lonely man. You know this man was possessed, but he was a child of God. Yeah, that's right, man. There's a man in there. That's right, man. And that's why Jesus spoke to the heart of the problem. He didn't say, why are you acting like that? Why are you going to scream so loud? Your behavior is just not right. He wasn't, we're not trying to dress up demons at Teen Challenge and have people shiny on the outside. If there's no heart change, if there's no encounter with Christ, that's the point. Yeah. The demons drove him to a solitary place. No one to love, abandoned by all. Jesus knew one day he would be deserted by his disciples, Matthew 26, 56. Little did this man know that Jesus would never leave him or forsake him. He was a possessed man. He was tormented. No one could pass by this way. In this town, he was well known. He was the worst demoniac mentioned. He had over 6,000 demons. He was violent. But Jesus came to heal all who were under the powers of the devil. Thank you, Lord. In Acts. He went to a suicidal man. He would often cut himself with stones and cry out day and night. He wanted the pain. He wanted to stop the pain. He wanted to die. He was without hope. He was tormented. He was hurting himself. He was tormented. Every year, millions of people globally die from suicide. We have many women who come into our home who have struggled with that in times of desperation. Now God is a God of hope today. Yes. He is a God of hope today. Yes. And only Jesus could take away the hurts, our hurts and pains and give us a new life. He came to be the substitution to 
substitute for us so that we can live. Isaiah 53, 5. So we see here, Jesus came to an unclean, naked, homeless, scary strong, lonely, possessed, suicidal, tormented, lunatic. That's what was on the other side. That's what he went to meet. There was a divine appointment for that man. Just like there's a divine appointment for each and every one of us today. God is ready, willing, and able. So after meeting Jesus, we read in verse 35, he was clothed and in his right mind. Yes. He was clothed and in his right mind. Yes. Thank you. Clothed and in his right mind. Those who had seen told how he had been cured. Jesus had commanded the heart of the problem out of this child of God. They crossed over and endured the storm. There was an appointment on the other side. At Teen Challenge, we see so many men and women get delivered from the bondage of addiction. And some of the things that I just, I just said, they come into us in all kinds of conditions, physically, mentally, spiritually. And there are some obvious behaviors that can't be happening when they come in, you know? God cleans us off, polishes us a little bit, you know, and then starts pouring the word into us. And everything that we've learned that's been contrary, we are confronted. Yeah. We are confronted with change. Right. We are confronted with change. Yes. But many of us who have lived, be it sex trafficking, prostitution, can have that shame. You know, as a mom who lost my children, it was a very hard hurdle to overcome when I was faced with myself after running for 12 years. Because even though I knew the Lord growing up, when I ran in my rebellion, I ran hard. And I knew God had a plan for my life. And it drove me further and further until God was kept knocking at my door. He kept knocking at that door. And all the seeds that were planted throughout my childhood, in school, in church, in Sunday school, those things didn't leave me. You know, my, my addict friends was like, wow, you know a lot about the Bible. Like, it just wasn't like normal to them. I was odd. And I knew I was different. I knew. And the, there wasn't enough drugs to silence God's voice in my life. Amen. So coming to a place of surrender to him, right. the first hurdle, the first hurdle was met. I knew coming into this program that it was faithing that this was like coming home for me. And when I walked through the doors, when I say I felt like I was coming home, I identified with that God again, with God. The God I knew as a child and the God that I prayed to. But there were, now the, the real work began. I had to learn how to live. Yeah. There was an emotional stunt in growth from 12 to 24, major part of my, my adolescence and early adulthood. And we have women coming in in all ages in life. But for me, I had to relearn. I had to experience. I had to go back so God could build me the right way. Yes. We have women who come into the program that are college graduates, that have had careers. My roommate in the program was a theater director from New York City. And God used all these women in my life, watching them as a resident in the program, encourage each other learn from each other, see each other grow, and have breakthrough, and families be restored. Yeah. Visits with children, that, that didn't happen before, because now we are clothed and in our right minds. Yeah. 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 God is faithful. Life can beat us down. It can be lonely. There can be desperate times in our life. There are situations and circumstances that may come while you're in that boat that you never saw coming. But just know that he's in the boat with you. Oftentimes on the other side, it's unfamiliar. God may be calling you to the other side. God may be just knocking at the door of your heart. And you're like, you know, we tend to look at our own resources and our own strength and our own level of comfortable. God, I can't do that. How am I going to do that? Like Moses, I can't even speak. You want me to do what? We have to get in the boat. 
and know that there's purpose. There's purpose in the process to where God is taking you. Whether you have known the Lord for 30 years or you're new in the faith, God's in your boat. And he wants to help you brave the storms of life with him. And through that, you will be tested and you will be tried and you will become stronger. You know, no, like I love the idea of going to the gym and, you know, um, but the actual working out, getting there and doing what I need to do <laughs> to get to the place where I'd like to be, it's a whole nother story. And so it is with our walk. It's the same way with the Lord. You know, we, when the ladies come in the program, they're given uh, curriculum at each level of the program, you know, the introduction phase, you know, why am I here? Some basic scriptures and some books to read. We start them in the Word. And again, sometimes there's that honeymoon period, you know, with the Lord, and other times there's not. But they learn every day to push through. And the people that God has placed there, this is His ministry. And what He does here, it's by his power and it's by his strength. If we make ourselves available to him, God will give you what you need to do what he's calling you to do. And that is what he does. He doesn't want us to be blown aside. He doesn't want us to fall aside at the least little wind because we have no root in him. We get joyful and receive it, but when push comes to shove and the rubber meets the road, it's very sad you know, that every woman that comes to the program doesn't make it, but that's reality. I've seen so many success stories. <coughs> but I've also known some that tragically, um, that tragically met their end by addiction. Yes. So I thank God every day for what he does in the lives of these women here and that there is hope. Amen. 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 My husband is a graduate of this program something I never thought in my life would be something I would attain because I was an empty shell of a person. You know, the A, the, the A and the Z, I knew, but the A through the Z, I didn't know. So even in relationships, just learning how to be was a whole different level. And that's why, you know, in any recovery, you know, they'll say, you need to focus on you for the first year. And it's very important because God knows what he's calling you to. And we have to be in love with him first. He's got to be our all. He has to be our everything. Everything else, everything else will come in time. He doesn't want us to use anything to fill that void. He is our, he is the lover of our soul. So if we're to be like Jesus today, we have got to go to the other side. We can enjoy being in Galilee. It can be familiar. But God's calling us out to the other side of the lake. There are too many people in this world to not make ourselves available to the Lord for his purpose. So, two thoughts I'd like to leave you with today. And I'm going to sing a song. But the first thought is, um, is, is God calling you to the other side? Has God been knocking at the door of your heart? Is he calling you out? Yes. Is he calling you to something uncomfortable? Oftentimes, when we can endure and embrace uncomfortability, we will experience the most growth because we have to trust him in the process and know that it's his strength that works through us. Are you in the boat? You're really unsure right now. Again, just know that Jesus is with you in the boat. Yes. And he wants to strengthen you because he knows what's on the other side. You know, when I first came to came back to the Lord, I sensed and knew God had a plan for my life, but he didn't lay it all out for me the right. first 30 days in the program and say, this is what you're going to do. No, I had to stay in the moment. I had to trust God every day. Every day. Every day. Right. Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. I had to learn to depend on him for sustenance for each and every step of the way. Right. Mm -hmm. And he would fly on the flame of hope. He gives us glimpses here and there. But he also knew that I was in no way, shape, ready. If I didn't know what he was calling me to, I'd been like, forget it. There's no way. I was so shy and I was so hindered in my relational skills because of addiction. I didn't even know how to talk to people. So when the Lord spoke to me through the word as a new student, and he talked about 
using my voice and my mouth and different things. I was horrified. So I trust God every day. And through the different challenges and things that I experienced in the ministry and the different capacities, God grew me and taught me um, from learning how to check chores to learning how to run a shift to working with people to learning to be responsible with the little things. Learn how to walk with integrity so he could trust me with more. Just wanting to serve him. So maybe you are on the boat today. Just know that the, the trials come to perfect our faith. Don't jump ship. It's a lot worse outside the ship than it is. I'd rather be in the boat with him through the storm than jumping out, you know, left to my own with no anger. Been there. And, you know, my other thought to leave you with is maybe you are on the other side. Maybe... Maybe you need the Lord more than ever before. Maybe you don't know him. Well, he's here. And the same offer from the beginning of time is still offered to us today, and that is Christ and him crucified for our sins, that we may have life and have life abundantly. I'm going to sing this song for you. It's called In Return. When I came to the Lord, I came just as I was, Dope sick, full of shame. But in return, what he has given my life, not because of any of my good works, because I certainly didn't come in with a resume. Mm -hmm. You know, what God has done in my life is all glory to him. Amen. So if you would worship with me, close your eyes if you'd like. I would just like you to think about that today. Where is God calling you? Calling you to get off the shore, in the boat. There are others who will meet you on the other side, and they will pray with you and help you along on your journey. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, I 